Orato samba samudasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samba samudasa namo tassa bhagavato the holy one the worthy one the fully enlightened one sadhu 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 Hope everybody had a good week and I hope everything's going well for you. I didn't give you a topic today. <clears throat> I thought that I would, um, can you hear me okay? Is it okay? Good. I've had such a scratchy voice for the last month. I just can't believe it. I sound like an Irish washerwoman, <laughs> you know? And it's mostly because of the climate cold that I had, and it's been really hard on my voice. Anyway, I thought it would be interesting um, for us to talk today about a sutta that Bhante usually uses at the end of each retreat. And this is one that is called the Kakachupama Sutta. I'm not going to go into the whole sutta, but just to the main point, at the end of each retreat, he uses the sutta because of section 19, where it speaks to you about what I call a measurable outcome for twin practice. What it is we're trying to do is give you a practice that results in this as the outcome of your practice that you can use in life all the time. And so you listen to it, he's saying, so bhikkhus, there are five courses of speech that others may use when they address you. Their speech may be timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh, connected with good or with harm spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. When others address you, their speech may be timely or untimely. And when others address you, their speech may be true or untrue. And when others address you, their speech may be gentle or harsh. And still others address you, their speech may be connected with good or with harm. And when others address you, their speech may be spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. Herein, you should all train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for our welfare and for their welfare, with a mind of loving kindness, without inner hate. And we shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And starting with that person, we shall abide pervading the all encompassing world with a mind similar to a cat skin bag, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, without ill will. And that's how you should train. So here we get this really, really clear picture. What was the Buddha doing with the lay people? He was giving them an alternative approach to communication in their dealings with their loved ones, with their neighbors, with their communities, at work, at school, and at home. We see inside of this, basically, he is saying that someone might come to you and speak to you, and it just feels like it's not the right time. And you don't give them space. You don't want to give them space. They may be upset about something. Part of this is about compassion, isn't it? So part of it is about 
how should we be coming to these people when they are talking to us about something that isn't important to them right now, to us, okay? Or others are addressing you about something that's true or untrue. And it's difficult not to come back and just get defensive immediately. When others address you, their speech might be gentle or harsh. Maybe it is gentle, but maybe it is harsh. Can we just listen? And others address you, it's connected with good or with harm to you or to others. And when others address you, it's spoken with a mind full of loving kindness and compassion. They can see it, they can feel it coming from you. In fact, uh, you are able to practice by practicing loving kindness. Remember those loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. You remember the pieces of what we are told if we're practicing that in our mind, loving kindness, no thoughts of ill will can happen. And then we're practicing compassion, no thoughts of cruelty can be happening, coming up. And when we are uplifting ourselves into a higher level with joy, then no discontent will jump out. And if we're practicing equanimity, there is no aversion to anything that's happening, which is the highest level of practicing. These things could straighten out a lot of things in the world lately, that you agree with me about that. But we, we don't seem to be able to do that. A lot of times human beings are on the defensive right away. The moment something is, is said, part of our igniting suffering is our defensive mechanism. That's coming from the Atta. So these pieces I'm trying to show you are all interwoven. So the Atta is I, me, my, and mine. If I'm always in that frame of mind, then I start to always get on the defensive to whatever is said. Do you mean that about me? Are you saying that at me? Are you angry at me? Immediately the assumption is there. This is a sad thing about human beings. It's like there's something caught in our DNA. You can't find it. And something is caught in that, that wonderful picture of the DNA twisting around, you know? There's two little pieces in there, some pieces in there of, yeah, but what do you mean by that? Well, why are you saying that at me? And why is this happening to me? And all of these are stemming back to the Atta teaching. Wait, listen to the Atta teaching. You know, if I see something with the eye, see the form, and eye consciousness comes up, the contact happens. With contact as condition, a feeling happens. With feeling as a condition, then craving will come up for an untaught mind very quickly. And I don't like it. And then I don't like it because it reminds me of what happened before in my life that was similar to that. And I'm replaying it, replaying it, replaying it. It's frustrating. I'm struggling to defend myself from this because it must be happening to me. That's the error that we make. The Buddha tries to straighten us out. He, he comes around from those six years he spends trying to figure out what is happening with suffering. Why couldn't he find it for six years? Because there was a standard practice at the time for one thing. If we cause enough pain in our body, our mind will stop thinking about anything but that one thing, the pain. And from that, maybe our mind will open was what was thought could happen. So let's lay down on nails tonight. Ah, <laughs> you know, or let's torture ourselves and not eat anything for one straight week or stop drinking water 
and just see what happens. How long will it take? How much pain? How much suffering do we have to go through? And then in 36, if we go to 36, he's describing all of this. In 36, he's telling you that stuff didn't work. How serious did it get for him? If we go to 36 and we start listening, he's saying that no matter what he tried, he could not develop any noble states, could not see or figure out how the suffering was working. He couldn't. He kept thinking about practicing the breathing meditation. He tried very hard with the breathing meditation. So he thought maybe if I start holding my breath in section 21 in Majima Nakai number 36 in the Mahasachika Sutta, maybe I should just hold my breath for as long as I possibly can. And he held it until there was only the sound a loud sound of winds coming out of both his ear holes. And it sounded like a smith's bellows at the, you know, the place where they, what do we call the blacksmith? The blacksmith bellows breathing. He's hearing this coming out his ears. He's holding his breath. And that's all he's hearing is the tiny bit of air that can go through that channel. And he's hearing that he stopped them through his nose and then he stopped them through his ears. And it was very loud winds coming in, but his body became overwrought, uncalm because he exhausted from the exhaustion of painful striving. And he was not able to attain any knowledge about the suffering in this way. Further, he tried again to stop his in-breaths and out-breaths again. And then it started cutting into his head and he had headaches. Not good. So all of these, the masochistic ways of torturing the body with pain in order to get to maybe one channel of thinking. We can identify with this, can't we? In city living in Western societies, we're thinking of a hundred things at one time in our head. We go to exhaustion, to tension and to stress and into depression often as a result of a totally tangled up mind. A mind that's trying to handle absolutely everything to the point where many people will just have a complete shutdown and breakdown. He tried to get to only one thing, and that was the concentration on the pain in the body from this. And there's almost, I think there's five sections here about the, the, the breathing and how bad it got in 36. I think it comes from, I'm looking at it, I think I see it coming from where it starts to be described in 21, 22, again, even more torturously, and then 23, and then 24, and then 25, where they're just stopping breathing, attempting to torture themselves to open the mind. Is there any calm in that? Is there any tranquilization of the mental formation or the bodily formation in that? Is there any just being in that? No. There's a struggle, tremendous struggle. And then he tried cutting off food as a desperation. And the fasting was very serious. In section 27, he starts by uh, attempting the fasting and it gets more serious in 28. And it gets to the point where some people said that Godama is dead. And they would say, the Davis, no, he's not dead, but he was black. No, he is brown, but Godam is neither black nor brown or golden skin. Much is clear. So much had the clear, bright color of his skin deteriorated through eating so little. 
And if he took his hand, and actually women can experience this. I wanted to tell you this. When you have a baby, if you're lying on the gurney, you can take your hand right after the baby comes out for the next few hours. You're just lying on your back. There's nothing here inside. It's an empty spot. The baby just came out and you can reach right in and touch your backbone. Shock. I had a doctor when I had my first child who knew about that. He, he was trying to make me stop shaking because I was so cold because the heater had been removed, as he put it. And I couldn't stop shaking and he didn't want to give me any drugs. And he said, let me show you something. So he made me laugh because he took my hand and he put it right here and said, make a fist and just put it down inside. I could touch my backbone. And then later when I'm a Buddhist, I'm reading this, I'm saying, you know, this is real. You can really do this. As a woman, we go through this experience where we're just emptied out very quickly. And then here is this blank spot, the organs have not fallen back yet. And you can actually do that. But by these racking practices of austerities, it tells us in section 30, he did not attain any superhuman states, no distinction in knowledge and vision that was worthy of him being a noble one. And he wonders, could there be another path to enlightenment? And then what happens is he remembers the rose apple tree. We've talked about this before. So my question to most of you is, have you gone out yet and sat under a tree? Find yourself a decent tree. That's about like this, you know, about like this, okay? It has to be at least 12 inches in, uh, in diameter or about like that, if you can find a big one. In Asia, you can really find some nice ones and just lean against the tree and just sit and just take in the tree, nothing else. Listen to the heartbeat of the tree, to the living tree that you're leaning against. Depends how far you can get with this. You know, I'm Irish and I can get pretty far with it, <laughs> but trees are very slow talking or saying anything. That's a tricky part. But you can actually say, yes, this is alive. Yes, there is a, you know, fluid flowing through the veins of the tree. And yes, it's a living, breathing tree working to give us oxygen. It's actually this beautiful giving tree. That's a that's the name of a book. You should find it on the internet. It's called The Giving Tree. If you've not ever read it, you should give it a chance and read it. It's about a little boy that had a tree that talks about his whole life and how the tree kept giving and giving and giving. Shade, oxygen, lumber. <laughs> All these things, a place to sit in the end of the story. I would have written it a little different, I think, but I would like the tree to keep, be, keep staying there for many, many generations to come. Coming back to this, though, in 21, when you go back in 21, what do we do with our relationships? The one thing the Buddha brings to us is we do have the power of change. I've been stuck with that for a mm, couple of months now. Everything going on in the world, and we have the power of change. Human beings do have the power now, and quite essentially probably the technology, that it could feed and house and clothe everybody on the planet. And yet it is caught caught in misunderstandings. We want to say just simply it's greed, hatred, and delusion. Sometimes it's a desperate move by a leader to protect people because of a belief that something is happening that is threatening this, these people or those people. And this is where the guts and the soul of the, of the, the core teaching comes from the Buddha of these four Brahma Viharas, 
and not just talking about them, but taking them and applying them, applying them in each and every situation, in sales, in marketing, for the CEO of the company, for manufacturing, on the line, material handling, everything down the line. How can we do that? How can we? By deciding to, what holds us back? We forget to say to ourselves, if not me, then who? And if not now, when? Because it's time. It's time for us to bring out of our minds and into the world the way we want the world to be. That's the thing that seems to be missing more than anything. So in talking about this, we're looking at the different ways people can approach us. They can be gentle, they can be harsh, it can be timely or untimely. What they're saying is true or untrue. It, what they're saying is with intended harm or with loving kindness or with inner hate. Does it matter? You say, Sister Kama, what do you mean? Does it really matter what they say to you? Because don't you have your little team flag on the wall by now? You know, the yellow flag with a dark orange writing that says Anicca on it? Because whatever is going on, you don't have to strike back. You don't have to. You can remember that everything will change. Is it a source of suffering, the change? Yes. When it happens suddenly, of course it is. But then when you feel utter and completely stuck, remember, nobody's stuck. It's a perspective of how you choose to look at where you are, isn't it? Hmm? There was a story that Bhante used to tell me about a flower. It's a rose. And the question is, why is it that if you look at the top of a rose, you see one thing. If I hand you, just hand you a rose, and it still has the thorns on it, do you only see the thorns or do you see the rose? A rose is a rose, he'd say. If you cut, clip one and give you a rose, but it still has the, the thorns on it, I'd say. But is it a rose? Yeah. Then I gave you a rose. <laughs> so you give me a rose. Do I have to take the thorns off before I get to the rose? It's a fascinating thing. It is. Do you see the way at this point with your practice? Do you see the way to apply it to make a difference in your life? That's the thing that you need to ask yourself. It's a simple little practice, isn't it? I just did a, um, well, actually I can take you through this. I actually did a review PowerPoint um, I think earlier today. Let's see, I have to go to, um, let's see how I do this. Okay, I'm gonna jump over here someplace to pull something up. Um, be right back, I'm right here. I was working on this yesterday and I thought there's gotta be a way we can use this when we are, um, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have to go minimize this for a minute, come back to you.
Okay, now let me go in the share screen. I haven't done this before with you, but on the sharing, um, let's see if I put the, I'm gonna go through a PowerPoint. I might run through it a little quickly for you, but, and also if you want it, I will send it to you, but I was editing it last night. And it's a reevaluation of Paticca Samapada. And this is one of the ways to get at how to use the teaching. And the question that was going on with one of the students was, why do we need to get involved with Paticca Samapada, which is dependent origination. But actually, it's the Buddha's analysis of human cognition. And it is the people's partner for sanity, is what I call it. By learning human cognition well enough, you um, can uh, actually, you can actually, um, it's teaching you how the suffering actually works. So if you're, if you're caught in, in really understanding how the six R's help you and how human cognition helps you, let's go through this and take a look at it. And then if you want it, I can email it to you. You just need to let me know that you want me to email it to you. So correctly applying the steps of Buddhist right effort reveals the key to Dhamma knowledge. The Four Noble Truths, there is suffering, the cause of suffering, cessation, and path, dependent origination or dependent co-arising, which some people like to call it that way, um, in the universities seem to like that right now. When we observe dependent origination more closely, we are witnessing how suffering arises step by step. I've told you before, it's like taking a... Uh, you're, I watch you have a conflict with someone in one event and I take a movie of it and then I pull it out and we look at the slides of each part of the film as it's actually happening so you can see how it's happening and that is what dependent origination does. When we observe it more closely, we are witnessing how suffering arises step by step and you can witness the cause of it, feel the sensation of it, realize how, realize how, how, okay. Realize how, how an escape is possible. And the three characteristics of existence, I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but are anicca, dukkha, and anatta. So this is seeing the impermanence of each link as it's happening, arising, being there, and passing away, okay. The dukkha, how the tension happens that causes the suffering, and anatta, how the impersonal nature of what we are seeing, if we look at things that way, we make a habit of looking at that way all the time, we relieve ourselves from the suffering. This is the paticca samapada, the cycle of the human cognition. And you're basically, the 12 pieces are here. I don't know if I can make them actually work because I'm doing it on this program, but this usually spins around. And it's showing you all 12 pieces as they are spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. And as one circle starts to spin, this is happening so, so fast. It's producing hundreds of other little circles inside of it. And so if you wanted to see how it sort of looks like, more like a slinky, you know, this coil, uh, metal coil, and you pull it apart and it's just turning more and more circles because you're caught, because you don't know what's happening. So this is 12 conditional links that seem like an unending cycle that are producing an energy that catches us on this spinning wheel of suffering. And if we remain ignorance of how this works, then we can never get free from this cycle of suffering. We can never, oh, look, there it goes. <laughs> it keeps going and going. Okay, so here is the chart that we work with when we are, whoops, we need to go back one. When we are um, working with the 12 links and most of you, if you have not seen this before, I would send this to you and have you just to read it through. But the ignorance is when we don't understand 
the four noble truths. We don't understand what they are or what they're for. We impersonal process of dependent origination. Um, we have to understand that we're ignoring human cognition and it's because it isn't in our education system and it's really too bad because nowadays there's a lot of studies about this and people should have it in the high school health class so that people can spot for themselves when they have too much tension, too much stress and are starting to get into depression when they're not wanting to go out and be with people. They were getting agoraphobic. They want to stay in, withdrawn, this sort of thing. And the three characteristics we should be able to identify. The formations that the human being uh, has pr produces, these formations, the um, reflection of past formations are sitting here in this pot of uh, three kinds of uh, formations bodily formations, verbal formations, or mental formations. So this one here, this link is sort of like the holding spot for the uh, components or effects of past karma as it comes into the person, but it's not active. The, these formations are the residual of past actions sitting there that might affect you in this life. You could look at it that way. And some people, I was thinking about changing this because I like it much better. And actually, Bonte liked it much better. Uh, Nanyananda is the one that calls this formations preparations. And I actually like that because this, this part here we call potential pieces of these 12. And the consciousness here is in a potential pool, like you had a swimming pool inside your body. It's just full of soup. That's consciousness, that which cognizes that power, but it's inactive. So it's like a potential part of this whole thing. The next one, mentality, materiality. We gave you a simple, simple way after probably a year of discussion to talk about mentality as the mental part of a process in the operation of each of the six sense doors. Each of the sense doors deals with a mental function, consciousness and perception in the process of getting to contact. So we had to look at this as in a very simple way. It's all you really need. And the materiality, it means the actual material part, for instance, this ear, the actual earth element of this ear or nose or tongue or eye or body. Um, that's all this is. Mentality, materiality has to be there. And the six sense doors have to be functioning in the body. They have to be actively um, functioning well in order for you to experience and understand this process. Then contact happens. Contact we say C equals consciousness as in the I plus forms and I consciousness equals I contact. Ear and sound and ear consciousness, okay? That one equals contact. So contact is formed six different ways through the six sense doors. And the components of it is the sense door the sense door object and consciousness, the three pieces they make contact happen. Vedana or feeling happens next with consciousness as conditioned feeling arises and they're pleasant, painful, or neutral. Craving happens with feeling as condition and craving always manifests. This is part of the miracle here, this part is part of the miracle because when I call it a miracle, this is what he found, craving has a symptom and craving always manifests as tension and tightness in mind and in body. This is where the Vipassana practitioner has an edge because they've paid such close attention to feeling in the body anywhere internally or externally feeling. So they're able to, to learn if they just open to it noticing a change in tension and tightness, that means something is going to happen. I is coming up and I like it or I don't like it. Mind is what's happening. The next one is clinging 
And this is the story that runs in your mind immediately after that about why, I'm sorry, that's doing that, why, uh, why you like or dislike whatever it is that came up. And this includes all of the thoughts, opinions, ideas, concepts, and even imagination that pops up about what you liked or you didn't like when it came up. And that's what causes you to jump into habitual tendencies library and pull out a card that is your personal reaction. This is part of your behavior patterns. What do you do if this happens or this kind of thing happens socially or someone says this or does this or you hear something or see something what do you do do you actually respond or do you immediately react and the reactions are from the people with untrained minds about all this and 85 percent of what we do apparently is reactions in life which is too bad and the rest is responses and we want to get to where the responses are 85% and the whole world will change is the way I see it, you know. And then the birth of action happens. This is the birth of the reaction if for the untrained mind or the action for a more trained mind, a mental reaction, a verbal reaction or a bodily reaction, okay. Now, if we want to know how does this feel like, what does this feel like as it's happening, we had to invent, and I say we, Bunty and I were driving in the car for hours and hours and hours across the country for two years. And um, we would go through creating these things. And this is where the simile of the car came from. So the simile of the car, how does it feel as this line of con condition, cognition is actually happening? How does it feel? Can you pretend, if you pretend you are beginning to drive your car to work, you might figure this out if you have a stick shift. You put the key in the ignition and contact, that's contact, where you put the key in the ignition, the subject comes up, you're going to drive. Turn the key and start the engine, you feel the engine, don't you? First gear jerks the car forward, and as emotional tension arises, that's what craving is. It's the slight jerk inside you, like, like that, very quickly. Okay, the next one. Second gear involves more mental thinking, mental proliferation begins, and that one is craving. Third gear tightens the tension with inside you as you drive faster down the ramp and get on the highway. And these are your habitual tendencies. You, if you, you don't even think about it, relaxing while you're driving, you're automatically getting more tense when you're gonna enter a line of traffic. Fourth gear speeds down an entrance ramp onto the highway itself, and that's the birth of the reaction once you're pulling off the ramp into the traffic. And then just imagine for a minute that you run out of gas as the aging of the event takes place, including any sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, because you are on the side of the road without any energy for your mobile phone because you can't call for help. And that is the end of that event. And by then you're worried about how you're going to get a ride to get gas and how's it going to turn out. That's the simile of the car. If you change your mind, this is the what the Buddha, the Buddha actually came up with for us. If we change our mind, you can change your life. And you can change your behavior patterns, which are habitual, by creating a new, healthy, habitual line of action instead of reaction. Can gaining knowledge of how human cognition helps to free us from suffering, is, will it help if we gain knowledge about this? Obviously, it will, because learning about uh, about this can help us manage some of the common medical conditions, for instance, a little better that we face in modern times, such as anger and sleep and high blood pressure and depression and tension and stress disorders, anxiety, panic attacks, anorexia, agoraphobia, overwhelming, debilitating grief when we have too much grief and we're sitting in it. 
then it gets very unhealthy and debilitating. Can it assist pain management when you're injured? Yes. Suffering degenerative diseases such as arthritis? Yes. Personal management of terminal illnesses, the pain that happens during those illnesses? Yes. And reduce ongoing patterns of pain in life? Yes. And release releases disturbing emotions faster when you're understanding how they work. Yes. So how did he tell us to do this? What is often found to be a root cause for these debilitating conditions? Can direct knowledge of these conditions arise and help us reduce our suffering? By observing seven of these links, we can find some of the answers about this. And so this is the other chart. This is what we call a training chart. We like to call this a training chart, one you keep in your pocket sort of thing. So we're only looking now at seven links. At the point of contact where it happens, the feeling arises, the craving, like or dislike, the mental proliferation of running around in your mind, and then your habitual reaction you pull out the birth of the reaction, and then we're looking at the aging and death, the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, and how that actually happens. So this is a training chart. If we just learn these seven, if we just remember them, at the end of the day, we can sit down and figure out why we're upset over what happened at 12 o'clock today with someone, or what went wrong in the office and how we can change next time. If we replay it in our mind, what happened in the situation using this chart? How can we actually see suffering? You learn the seven links, you notice the impersonal, how impersonal the process is each time. That's what you watch for. In passing, uh, notice how uh, after it happens, it means Notice how suffering happened through the same links each time. Practice your observation to notice how the th these steps of any event after it happens and review the arising symptoms that indicated craving was arising. Next time, as you notice the changes in tension in your head, let go of that tension and purposely relax or tranquilize the mind as you return to whatever you were doing with a smile. She still needs to be put on there. How can we see suffering? You're practicing to see the links of contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendencies, which are your reactions and the birth of those reactions and the aging and death of the event. That's what you're practicing to notice how impersonally this happens the same way every time. Mechanically, operatively, it does. None, none of the situations are totally identical, but the way that you get into tension and tightness and a funky mind is clearly by it happening the same way and you not understanding where you can catch this. So this is how you practice to notice there is an escape that's possible during any event and how to change that suffering. So there are four steps of practicing what we call right effort properly that sharpen your observation. I'm going back directly to the text on this for the four steps that the six R's actually complete. So two steps are purifying your mind. The first one is to recognize the tension and tightness. The unwholesome state of mind has arisen. You're as it's rising or it's there. The second one is to let go of any attention that was placed on the unwholesome state of mind and relax your mind, relax your head. The two steps to retrain the mind that follow are part of this. And the third step would be bring up a wholesome mind state to replace it. And, and an instant smile is really what works the best. It's what we found out. And number four, support the wholesome state and develop other wholesome states and repeat the cycle as needed whenever uh, any distraction causes your attention to move away from your object of meditation or a task that you're doing in the day.
Now, if we only practice steps one and two of right effort, it does not lead to changing habitual tendencies of the mind because you're only purifying, but you're not replacing the unwholesome with the wholesome. You have to do that. So keeping right effort going by practicing TWIM, that's what we're practicing, tranquil wisdom, insight, meditation. The insight is how all this works. And the wisdom you're learning is how it actually does work as you continue to do it. So mindfulness is your observation tool, the skill, and it reminds us to keep our observation going and notice whenever our attention is pulled away. And the meditation, these are the steps over here. The meditation keeps us using this observation to learn how mind's attention impersonally moves we're learning about an impersonal process. That's what we're learning about, okay? And that's where this keeps spinning. As long as we do this the same way every time, your mind is gonna be trained to forgive, let go, relax, smile, come back and keep going. That's what it's gonna to learn to do instead of grabbing on to a hot coal and getting burned each time. And mindfulness, reminds us also to complete all the steps when you let go of an distraction and replace it with a wholesome mind state. You don't want to skip these steps. And this one, this I'm not going to read through this whole thing. Actually, I think you can, uh, you can, you know, write me and I'll send it to you. But the, this is the recognized step. I'll try to do it. Let's see. When you recognize a change of tension or tightness in the head or mind or another part of the body, you're beginning to notice how craving actually occurs because craving always manifests as tension and tightness in both mind and body. And so this is how it works. And whenever mind's attention moves, tension increases. And this tightness is the physical symptom for a rising craving that we need to notice. The release step, if you notice a pulling sensation on your mind, attention away from your task or your object of meditation, then you should release the attention off what came up. Do not engage it. Remember that's in, that comes from Majima Nikaya number 22, section six. Do not engage it. The only way the object that came up can become an obstruction is if you engage it. That's what it's telling you in 22. Alagadupa Masuda. The content of a distraction is not important, but how it arose is very important. Just let go of any tightness around it. Let it be there without engaging or indulging in it. The next step is to relax. And when we relax after releasing the tension initially, there is a subtle, barely noticeable tension left over in the head mind. And so you apply the relaxed step to empty out whatever's left. And there is a momentary sense of relief. This is the moment you realize the true nature of cessation of craving, that it can be revealed. We also call this, doesn't, okay, the meditator can see this while performing the release and relax steps. Uh, and between the relax and the smile, there is this tiny, tiny little point and it's called pure mind or still point. It's no craving. The re-smile step, smiling in your mind by slightly raising the corners of your mouth, flexes a muscle that relaxes the brain and sharpens your awareness. You are training mind to notice a change in the tension and tightness in your head. And that indicates the arising of the craving as early as possible each time you run the cycle. And this is so that you can escape the suffering. Getting serious, tensing up, pinching the eyebrows together or frowning causes a heaviness and slow mindfulness. But when mind gets dull and slow, it is more difficult for insights that we need to arise. And so you can see how everything works. It slows everything down. You return and while you are smiling, you gently return mind's attention back to the object of meditation. The breath and relaxing or metta or karuna and relaxing. 
Then continue with a gentle collected mind and a little internal smile as you use your object for your home base, your recentering point. In daily life, whenever your mind is pulled off a task, while releasing, relaxing, and smiling, bring your attention back to the task. Repeat it as needed. This is the cycles really five steps. You just repeat it as needed. We put it in as a sixth one because you have to do it the same way again and again and again and again, the same exact way if you're gonna retrain mind. By purifying mind each time in this way, you replace old habits of craving and clinging, which causes suffering with new and wholesome habits of letting go, relaxing and smiling. And then life gets much easier. Repeating the cycle over and over again completes right effort and helps the mind not to hold on to stress. According to science, this kind of repetition can retrain your brain. And the practice teaches you the truths of the natural world so that we can begin to set ourselves free from suffering permanently. So in a sense, the Buddha Dhamma, it means returning us to our natural state, to nature. And each time we practice abandoning all distractions in this cycle, we complete the entire Noble Eightfold Path. And we uncover the four natural truths once again. The first truth was all living things experience suffering in life. The second one, all people can see, learn to see how the suffering is caused. The third truth, all people can experience the cessation of this cause of suffering. The fourth truth, all humanity can follow the noble fold Eight, eightfold path, uh, which supports the development of the proper conditions to experience cessation and the mind opening to Nibbana. Our meditation should demonstrate how we can benefit from the Buddhist teachings in a non-denominational way, because it should allow us to see how suffering operates allow us to see the cause of it and how to let go. That kind of a practice will eventually lead to a remainderless fading away and cessation of suffering and repeated experience of Nibbana. It reveals an inherent potential of an untapped human, actually, that's the untapped brain, human brains naturally. Um, the brain is untapped because we're so clogged up with past and future thoughts. We can't put the power of the brain to use. Only a few people can cubbyhole that, bring it right into one spot and use it. Try Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, people like that. Absolutely, incredibly innovative. Oops, okay, let's move back, okay. And that's the end of this. Um, let's see if I can get this to close. Stop the share. <coughs> so I'm throwing it out to you guys. This is why the dependent origination is so incredibly important. It's showing you the mechanics of how to live with a kinder end result of what the Buddha was teaching. He didn't leave anything out. One of the things that has happened um, is for us is that when we look at what do we really need to understand, I'm very attached to the Majjhima Nikaya. First, to train ourselves and to perfect the complete understanding of the practice, the complete teaching. And from there afterwards, going for support things from Samyutta Nikaya and Gutra Nikaya, and sometimes to the Digga Nikaya. Remember what I told you about Digga Nikaya, if you want to treat it fairly though, you take a retreat and you have one sutta for the whole week. <laughs> yeah, it's really true if you're going to do it justice. But 
the Samyutta Nikaya and Andutra Nikaya are tricky for one reason. If you understand the pieces necessary for the teaching first in the Majjhima Nikaya, when you go to the Samyutta Nikaya, you will understand the support pieces when they're written, even if they sound by, but they could sound by themselves contradictory to what you thought the teaching was about if you didn't use the Majjhima Nikaya first. That's what I run into sometimes. And trying to figure out why doesn't the person understand this particular little piece from the Samyutta Nikaya sounds contradictory, but it only sounds contradictory because they didn't meet all of the important pieces first that were in the Majjhima Nikaya. It's just something that exists. And of course, a lot of people like the Samyutta Nikaya simply because it's shorter pieces and we can take a short piece out and turn it into a Dhamma talk. But it's really worth it for you, as I've told you many times, to listen to your Dhamma talks and to go to Dhamma Sukha, to the library, and to go into the section where the, uh, the retreats are located and to... Um, choose a retreat and then choose a different retreat and follow each of the each of the days of the retreat again and again and again if you're hooked on one sutta it's interesting well what people told me was very interesting about Bhante Bimala Ramsey's teaching was he is so incredibly consistent how come they'll say this teacher is so incredibly consistent is because he's going from the text again and again and again. And that's what makes it consistent. Um, in other, you know, other ways, it could go all over the place if he was just teaching from his own ideas, but he's not. He's teaching with the guidance and the guidance was very balanced, sutta to sutta to sutta, subject by subject. So it's really worth it to, uh, we're going to put that index out shortly. I promise you, we're going to get it published this year. Uh, we're going to try it. It's finished. We just never, we never published it yet, but it's sitting there um, just ready almost to go out. Just a couple questions. And we need to get that because it consisted of where he, where did he get the information for the tranquil wisdom insight meditation? He put it together from the use of about 75 or 76 suttas inside the Majjhima Nikaya, there's 152 and 76 of them really have good advice for meditation practice, okay? That's important, directly um, affecting your meditation. Out of those 76 suttas, 22 of them are the principal source for the normal, uh, 10 day retreats that we use. There's 22 of them. And in those 22, you can teach six or eight topics perfectly so that they are making sense and they're hooking together like this. They just hook all together like that and they all fit together. That's what's important. Then when you go out of that book, after you have those six or eight topics and you go to other sources, you can understand very clearly what they're talking about because you have that as your foundation. But to go over to the support pages before you learn the subject, it's kind of like talking about mathematics. You take arithmetic and then you have algebra, or I'm sorry, arithmetic and then you have geometry, right? And then after geometry, you have algebra. And after that, you usually take calculus and then you go to higher mathematics. But you wouldn't do real well to try to go to algebra without the understanding of the other two pieces below that or calculus either. And it's similar with almost any kind of training. If I put you on a 28 speed, uh, 21 speed bike, good luck if you've not ridden a 10 speed or 15 speed bike and I put you on a a 21 speed bike, you won't be able to keep up with people. You won't understand the finer points of it because you don't have the basic information. And that's what seems to happen. I'll tell you one thing that was really good about training with Bunty was 
trying to decipher what people need the most in order to succeed with their practice. And so that's where I want to throw it out onto the floor to you. Do you understand how these, these things are constructed when we give you the training like for a dependent origination? Why, we're, why are we doing it the way we're doing it? In an applicable way where you can see how understanding this will actually change your behavior patterns. And that goes back to the word bhavana, where we used to say the definition was a development of mind. And it is, but it's also the development of behavioral patterns in life. So that's it for today. What you got for me? <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> hmm? Anybody? May. Mr. Kema, thank you so much for the PowerPoint. I, I think it was a fantastic way to summarize um, the main, you know, aspects uh, of, you know, this this text, Majima Nikaya, which I, I do agree, it's it's really like a manual. If we treat mm. it like a like a manual. Uh, if, if I may, uh, Sister Kema, I have a, a couple of questions mm -hmm. and also a couple of, if I may, uh, suggestions. So uh, first thing first, may we request that uh, a copy of this be uh, included when the YouTube recording is uploaded, just so that, you know, it can benefit everyone, if that's possible. I try to do that with Deepa. We have to ask her if we can put the file up where they can take a copy of the file. You can okay. send it to me, and then I'll uh, upload it on uh, this thing, uh, uh, the uh, Google Drive, and then we can uh, share the link. Oh, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. Uh, so um, a couple of questions I had was, um, the first one is, so I like the reference to um, uh, 77, when you're going through the right effort, um, having that little note that this is reference to Majima Nikai 77. I was kind of wondering if it would be useful to insert, you know, references to different suttas throughout that entire presentation, because there's so many references to like almost every uh to the main you know like uh um hannibal sutta um 38 um um you know just so like people who read it can see that oh this is this is really coming directly from the text not something that you know for fun being pulled out from nowhere or like Sister Kema said, this is not something that Bhante Vimala Ramsey come out with his own idea or something. No, I know, I know, you know, in some places that he's, some people are uh, actually almost attacking him right now saying Vimala Ramsey system, I will tell you something. Um, I know that it seems like um, in the last few years on our, on the website, it may appear that that this is Bhante Vimala Ramsey's system. But when I was trained and still to this day could have conversations with Bhante, one of the absolute rules was this is not my system, that this is my job to show you what I think the Buddha's system was. This is what it was. He didn't, he didn't invent any of this, none of it. He's not responsible to invent it. He was responsible for uncovering it, reclaiming it, and guiding people to test it for themselves. That's all. You see, I think this is a very, very important thing. I know there are some discussions going on on the internet at this time, uh, but it's I, I haven't been able to get to the bottom of all of it, but I know it's coming from one country where someone had a rough time. And I guarantee, I guarantee, if I go through that and examine the whole thing, it's usually because somebody has added other things to the recipe and not followed the instructions or mixed up the six R's and put them in different orders and everything like that or something else. 
And these things would have been caught on retreat by a good teacher. But our teachers haven't had the chance to actually physically come to go through retreats with us as we're teaching. That's been one of the drawbacks. And they don't catch very clearly what is happening for the person. That's what that's, what that's about. You know, because we've been through this uh, many, several times in the past 20 years, it's always turned out to be, but what was, what were the instructions? Go back and read the instructions. If you've done a retreat with me many times, I will tell you, go back and read the instructions or were what you just told me, was that in the destruction, in the instructions? No, no, it wasn't. I'll give you an example is like um, the relax step. Well, let's see, it took me five minutes. And the reason it took me five minutes to do the relax step is because I started with my head and I did a relaxation process through my whole entire body and I still had some tension in my ankles, but then I decided to come back and continue. That's the sort of thing, you know, and they'll say, how can it be? And what are we telling you how long it should take you to six R? actually five R if you want to be truthful, five R's, five steps, three seconds, two to three seconds. That's it. That's all. We didn't tell you to do anything in detail. We didn't tell you to get an encyclopedia out and study every single word of the instructions. We didn't tell you that. We told you something very, very simple and precise. And we worked a long time to make it as simple as we could possibly make it so that you could follow it precisely to see what would happen. I guarantee you can't bake a cake if you take the butter out of it. <laughs> You cannot have the muffins if you take the baking powder out. <laughs> you can't. They won't rise. Try making bread without yeast. I know there are some countries that like to do that. Uh, and it's good too, but it's not bread. <laughs> so, so this is the kind of thing that we run into. It's not unusual. But um, the problem is if you're, if you're going to take a cup to us, come and discuss it with us instead of getting angry and and uh matt and, and putting out sincerely this person really wants to help people to understand um but they don't understand and that's the issue here they have to go back to the instructions and start at square one and then test to see what will happen when we follow the recipe yeah yeah it's like the the what is the pastry chef when you're making french pastry and you want it to flake you know just be so light and flaky chinese do this too they have a pastry like that when you make that dough you're only allowed to touch it like twice it's not like bread dough where you have to beat it you know down and let it rise and beat it down again uh it comes out like leather <laughs> You know, you, you have to just touch it briefly and gently with your fingertips when you're mixing it up and rolling it out. It's very, pastry chefs make a lot of money, sometimes much more than the principal chef in a restaurant. And that principal chef, he can't make pastry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the thing. Go ahead, May. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah? this came up. Yeah. I was curious uh on the slide on the four noble truth out yeah. of curiosity uh sister kema could you explain why you label this as four natural truths because they are natural truths because the whole teaching goes back to nature a balance with nature Absolutely, because you could take any animal on the planet, not just human beings, and you can demonstrate the Four Noble Truths. I tried it with a horse. <laughs> I tried it with a dog. It works pretty good with a dog, too. But you can watch the dog. The uh, dog has many expressions. You know, their eyes change. And uh, you can tell when my, uh, my dog, I can tell this dog here, I can tell when he's suffering, precisely when he's, uh, when he's happy, when he's relaxed when he's tense you see so when you're saying the four noble truths there is suffering in life definitely there is suffering in life across the whole animal world it isn't just us there's a cause for it and the cause is the tension and tightness in the mind and in the body 
their little brains, the brains are not as sophisticated as the human being, but it's still working the same way, you know? And then the cessation of it, you can watch the release of it when they get past it and you can notice how the release happens. And then uh, the, the steps to, the, to understanding it better are a little bit different because of the brain capacity for configuration and analysis to, to understand what to do. But you can still teach them cues and cracker, you know, what do they call that? Where it snaps the thing, you, you know, it cracks when you squeeze it, clicker, clicker. You use clickers to train dogs and train horses and train animals and stuff. And if you click it a number of times, they'll let go and they'll, they'll just start playing and they'll let go of whatever it was they were thinking about. So tension and tightness and the release of the tension and the tightness and the personal kind of concern, moving on to the next thing. We human beings have this big brain, bigger brain, more complexity, lots of, and when we start, well, you know, you're an office manager, right? You still you work as an office manager? No, okay. But as an office manager, as a person who's a central <laughs> office manager, we used to have tons of things running in our mind all at once. I was an assistant office manager for 11 corporations desk in a big conglomerate thing. And these guys would come and with their set and expect you to remember what you were doing for each one of them and their assistants, you know? That's 22, 30 people. I don't do that, anymore. I don't wanna do it anymore. But, but the complexity of it and everything, your mind is just full of everything. Even if you're a single person running a business or you're an entrepreneur, oh my goodness, all the aspects of making what you're trying to do, making it work, go from the uh, innovation to uh, the uh, concept room, to the creation and construction, to the product, to the advertising, to the sales, to the management, to the shipping, to material handling for mass uh, delivery and uh, shipping and handling and follow-up and comments. That's a huge amount of things running in your mind. And, we're, and the Buddhist saying, just let all of that go, all of it, and watch just what happens with the human body um, from the best way to let that go is to set up the, you know, the pink trash can and the blue trash can for the, uh, the, the uh, future time and for the past time and have the silver trash can here and just keep putting things in the trash can until nothing else is moving in your mind. And then just watch how this works as something slips in and comes up and you get to watch all the parts of it. All the links is what you get to, those seven links is what you get to be able to see. Yeah, so simplifying, yeah, okay, yeah. But I think this is a good idea to try and reference the suttas into that. I can go back and do that, I think. And I can, uh, Bonte can put the copy away for them to get this file. You can do that. Yeah, he can do yes, that. Yes, I can do that. Huh? Okay, for you Google. Just put it on uh, this thing, uh, Google Drive, and uh, make a link, and I'll share it with Deepa. Okay. And she'll put it on the description. That's cool. Everett, how are you doing? <laughs> hmm? You doing okay? Yeah? Are you doing okay? Hey, I slept terribly this week, so I, I didn't, I didn't get, but uh, I'm doing pretty, I'm doing pretty well right now. So that's okay. fine. What are you doing? Are you working or at school or what? Working. So you working? So. Yeah. Well, it's it's. Where are you? I can't remember. Where are you located? The Netherlands. Netherlands. Well, everything's affecting everything right now, all over the place, in all different businesses. And it doesn't look like it's going to get lighter. It might get heavier before it gets lighter. But um, when you come home, what I suggest you do is when you walk in the door, if you have a sweatshirt on or something or a jacket, you take it off and you hang it up on a hook, OK? As you hang up your jacket on the hook, 
you make sure that everything that was going on at the office is getting hung up on that hook and just leave it hanging on the wall. And if you can do it, you turn your phone off for at least a couple hours. <laughs> Don't even let that phone be on when you get home and try to get yourself in a calm place where you can sit for 20 minutes, even 20 or 30 minutes, and then go on with your evening. It'll change a lot of things for you, okay? Try it, okay? I know as I told that story a long time ago about the man who used to come home and he'd walk in and he'd hang his coat up very pur pur purposely on the hook. And his wife said, why do you do that every night? And he told her, because when I hang this up, I hung up everything that's out there. When I come in here with you and the kids, I'm here. When I'm out there, I'm there. And that's what we need to be doing right now at this time. Even if we can only pull off two hours or three hours, we need to be able to do that at some point, okay? Okay. Yeah? Yes, Gina, um, for the people. Uh, reference footnotes properly they just put the entire link next to the instead of put placing like a normal footnote sort of thing so you probably follow that but i thought i it I'm, you mean you mean put the um foot notes for the reference on the suttas for the um for the um i'm sorry for the powerpoint right it doesn't have to be footnotes but uh um like like i did on the one page i put the where it came from you want to notate where it's coming from what was on the each page yeah, the reference are put in. Um, I'm I'm thinking of so, like something else I'm I'm reading right now. There, uh -huh. there are references uh, that are quite hard to catch. Um, you know. Yeah. Oh well, I I thought I'd say it because it it can really affect a read attack. So, and yeah. We should turn it into a little booklet, May. You know, that's what we should do. <laughs> Use the pages to do that. But one way is to, I, I don't like footnotes. I don't like to go to footnotes in the back of something. I don't, I don't like that. You know, but if you are putting footnotes are more effective to me as a reader if they're actually there on the page. Like Nanyananda's books, um, I don't know if I have one of those here. Um, but when he writes stuff, he always puts the footnotes, he draws a line and puts the, uh, the note for where it came from at the bottom of the same page. Then, then you know, the, here's, here's an example. I don't know if you can see this one, but this is like, you see what he's doing here. He's writing something up here, uh, up here. And then he draws a line and the reference parts are down at the bottom, right there. He's giving you, uh, so he's doing it uh, so you don't have to go to the back of this booklet or a book because most people don't read the footnotes. They don't. Um, and very well-educated people really like to have the, the footnotes, but they're, it's questionable whether they'll go to the back. Here's another page like that where he, oops, that's not working very well, but oops, let's see. <laughs> there, you can see where it, the line is and then at the bottom there's a section of notes on the same page is that kind of what you mean is that is that like what you mean yeah similar i wish i wish i could speak dutch <laughs> um yeah but uh, you should send me a picture do you have a can you send me a picture on uh, Twi what is it? Uh, hmm. WhatsApp, uh, send it on WhatsApp to me or send it in the email, a picture of the page that 
you're talking about can do that yeah okay you have my email i think um uh, it's just conti came at two at gmail.com we should probably put that up i guess when we do these talks <laughs> okay that's cool Everett. i'm gonna try and do that sama what are you up to yeah what are you up to Today, you mentioned about the dependent origination. Mm. That uh, the consciousness is uh, dependent on mind and namarupa. Mm, but, no. Consciousness comes before namarupa. Namarupa is dependent on the consciousness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, with ignorance, Jnana, pachaya, ignorance, ignorance pachaya as condition, rupa. avicca as condition, right? Mm -hmm. uh, oh. Sankara arises with Sankara as condition, consciousness arises. Consciousness is a condition, Nama Rupa arises. So, That's right, consciousness uh, condition uh, for Nama Rupa. Consciousness conditions the mind. Eh? After the consciousness strengthens, then it will condition the mind. Mutually, is it possible? It is. It is what actually I am observing. No, what you're you probably observe you're observing the sense door consciousnesses that can condition the mind. Correct. Consciousness link is the is the fuel tank for functional consciousness. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. In other words, the car can't drive without gas in it, okay? Vipaka, and vipaka the, consciousness. That is resultant consciousness after it's a strengthening that conditions the mind. That is what I'm observing. Yeah. This, individual sense door consciousnesses they condition the mind like eye consciousness ear consciousness nose consciousness tongue consciousness body consciousness and mind consciousness condition mind that would be a proper sentence a it proper is, state. it is it one way it is mutually conditioning each other the beginning what is that dependent origination origination is correct when the the action is through, it will be conditioning mutually each other. I guess you could say it that way. What do you think, Bhante? Yeah? Okay, thank you. They can say um, it that so way. In, uh, uh, if you go in uh, Diganikaya, there is a sutta where uh, the Buddha is explaining uh, about uh, uh, Buddha Vipassi. So over uh, the Buddha Vipassi, when he is uh, contemplating uh, the relationship between the consciousness and the Nama Rupa, he said that uh, the consciousness uh, is uh, conditioning uh, Nama Rupa, but without yeah. Nama Rupa also the consciousness is not there. So in this uh, also is, there is a, a mutual relationship. And in uh, our question- Sir, are you he's saying Kaya, it's like can, can join? Correct. Can join basic yeah. basic relationship. Your touch. It is like can a join. Yeah, can join. Yeah, yeah. Nama Rupa so cannot is, exist. Independent of the right? You consciousness Thank you. and consciousness Thank cannot you. exist without Nama Rupa. So that is. Thank you. That is a mutual kind of a. Okay. <laughs> okay then. So uh, should we end now, or is there any other questions? <laughs> consciousness cannot exist without nama rupa i would have to stop that i would say no <laughs> consciousness cannot exist without nama rupa that's not then you're saying that's where he that's where sarma just got the idea that the links are in the wrong order and that nama rupa oh, should come oh, but that is mutually they're both uh, uh, dependent on each other so uh, there mm -hmm. cannot be consciousness as a consciousness without a nama rupa so that is uh, also explained in uh, uh, Nyanandas Dependent Origination book also. 
he explains that uh, whole concept and the reads two reads which he puts uh, on the front of the book the cover okay. the basic thing about this uh, and this is also uh, mentioned in uh, the question answers in uh, majjhima nikaya so uh, uh, they the uh, question they is asked what is dependent on uh, uh, consciousness so number of see uh, uh, consciousness is dependent uh, the number of is dependent on consciousness then he asked uh, what is the uh, what is consciousness dependent on then uh, the, uh, i think sariputta answers consciousness is dependent on number of Where do you find that? Imagine, imagine. Yeah, Imagine. 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 Question answers. I think forty-three, forty-two or forty-three. No, no, that's not right. No, no. One more no. question. Look at it. Um, yeah. Consciousness cognizes in forty-three. All it does is it says, um, "Let's see. I got it right here." No. This Look guy. I'm always much. visiting this because I'm always suffering from the same thing, the same question. Yeah, we can. Consciousness. Consciousness is said, friend, with reference to what is consciousness said. It cognizes. It cognizes, friend. That is why consciousness is said. And what does it cognize? It cognizes. Um, This is pleasant. It cognizes this is painful. It cognizes this is neither painful nor pleasant. It's the cognition process in contact. That's what it's talking about. It cognizes. It cognizes, friend. That is why consciousness is said. Wisdom and con then it goes to wisdom and consciousness. So it doesn't put nama rupa in forty three. Didn't find that perception is there. Then uh... yeah, that that reference is. Strictly to point of contact with consciousness, where contact happens, then feeling arises, and it is something that con. It's all <laughs> like conscious. The when we when we did this, I want to tell you, Sarma. When we did this, we didn't do it as an in depth kind of definition. The way Nama, the way Nanyananda is treating it, we did it. We tried to get to the simplest thing we could get to with but understanding. Understanding. But, it, but easy understanding. Everything okay. what you are saying is correct. When yeah. you are implementing certain small doubts, yeah, they are right. Yeah, easy. yeah. The um, wisdom and consciousness are conjoined. Separate these. One day, one. I would like to ask you one question. Uh -huh. Yeah. See, immaterial realms. Because they are also conditioned. Which one? I didn't hear what I didn't hear what it was. Arup, Arupa realms. Arupa yes. realms. Being said, Arupa realms. Yes. At the time of death, they have only one consciousness or heart base or something that will be operating. Okay. At the time of death, because they are conditioned, even perception, feeling, everything should be there, but they have only consciousness. So uh, at the time of death, what will happen? Uh, at the time of death, it is difficult for me to say what will happen at the time of death uh, because uh, that is not an experience I uh, have. <laughs> so <laughs> okay, okay. Well, they're saying basically they're saying the last uh, cognition, the last thought, is the is sort of like uh, putting the put it, pushing the gas pedal down to send you in that direction. That's what they are sort of saying. So, in most of the uh, different um, traditions of Buddhism, I kind of agree that the last thought is very, very important for the person at the time of death. Now, this this has gotten this has gotten uh, mixed up a little bit because one person said to me, "When a person is dying, everyone should leave. No one should be there. They should be absolutely alone, and they shouldn't be around the person at all." He, the reason that the monk was saying this this way, was saying that the person should not be distracted in any way; that they should be um, sort of um, kidnapped to come back to the human. World again and, and again. In other words, if the people are standing around the person when the person is passing away, and all these loved ones are there, this is why this monk was saying this this way. I, I do understand it. Um, you know, they're thinking, "I love you all," but if you've all said now, the person, a friend of mine, just uh, he uh, lost his father recently, and as the person was dying, still awake and uh, conscious and. Till the person died, 
they're all saying what they needed to say to each other. It was very important. The mother said what she needed to say to her husband, the son to the father, the daughter to the father, and everyone was cleared, so to speak, not having any residual things they felt like they should have said before he died. So they had made peace with the person, so to speak. Now for them to be there probably wouldn't be very disturbing, but in some other instances when people are around you and everybody's upset that you're dying or they haven't made their balance with you before you're leaving, um, your, your tendency is to be worried about what's gonna happen to them when I pass away. This is what another friend of mine realized with her father when there was a contention over a piece of land in Sri Lanka, uh, that he was so concerned what she would do about it when he was gone, constantly worried to the point of death. You know, you know he's going to be forced to come back again and again, so concerned about the people in the family. This, this point of the last thought uh, the Tibetans are very serious about, you know, they're very serious about the, the pause between the dying and the coming back. I forget what that's called. What's it called, Bonte? The, Bardo. the, the what is it? Bardo. Bardo, right, the Bardo. That space between the point where you die and the point where you come back, there's space. And um, if you go into death uh, worried about that, then that can, the tendency is to think that that would, the theory is that that will steer you towards the last thought. So that's where this last thought business gets really important. You know, so this is one of the things we say to people, if they come to me and they say, my father just found out he has cancer. He has a few weeks to live. What can I do? The first thing I ask is, is the person conscious? If the person is conscious up to the point where they pass away, the best thing you can do is get that uh, scrapbook started while the person is alive and go over all the wonderful things and wonderful memories you have of that person with that person so that they are feeling good about what they accomplished in life when they leave. That's a very good thing to do. And then when they pass away, they will have heard, so to speak, what the king would have had read to him while he was dying. He would have had the chancellor come and stand at the foot of the bed and read everything he did during his reign that was good <laughs> to him while he was in the process of dying. So he would leave with peace of mind. I was a good person. I died the best I could. And, and I, I left, uh, you see. So this is where we're, we're looking at that example and we're saying, do this. Now the families that did this, this was a wonderful thing because they were uplifted whenever they were visiting the person before they died. And they were bringing photographs and stories and going, do you remember when we caught that big fish? Do you remember, do you remember when we all went hiking and we all fell in the mud when this, that trail fell out? We weren't hurt, but we were sure covered with mud and all the pictures and you're laughing and tell these stories and you're going over the music that you loved when you were here and the rest of it. And, and how everybody was together. That's a great thing, you know, to have that, you know, as, a memory and then put it aside and say the things to the person how much you appreciated them or settle out something that wasn't quite settled out before the person leaves and then let them go without any tension and tightness you see yeah so <laughs> that's the way to go you know <laughs> i used to say i made said i know exactly what i'm going to do when i die and somebody said what and i said well at the point where I know it's here, I'm just going to say one simple thing. It was good. That's all. <laughs> it was good. And it wasn't always good, but the lessons in it, the experience in it, uh, the gift of finding the Buddhism, the gift of being able to teach and share with you to, you know, work with you and everything. All this stuff is really, really good. There's a lot of, there's, we could go over all the bad things too that were there, but it's no point. You see, but the thing that the, the truth of the matter was, um, there was this woman who used to teach people after her husband died. I, I had a great, I admired her a great deal. She made a decision after her husband died and she thought she was going to have a breakdown, but instead she decided to go all around the world to take 
the insurance money that she got and everything. And she, I'm just going around the world to explain to people. I said, explain what? She said, explain that whatever it is that happens, happened absolutely perfectly. That's a tough one to accept sometimes. That's a tough one. You know, that the tornado came and leveled the house or that you, there's a, in the midst of a war and all this stuff happened, you're supposed to turn around and do that. Well, you could, you, you look at the sorrow, lamentation, pain, the grief and despair people are going through and you tell them something like that. She said, yes, but if they pause and they just are quiet and they actually look, they're gonna see that whatever it was, it did happen perfectly. And this is the bad and the good and the ugly and the beautiful and everything. And it was a strange thing, but you know, she's actually right. She's actually right. It's just very difficult to get past the really hard ones, the really sad ones, the really hurtful ones. Then we have to laugh. We have, Bunty always taught me, you have to keep laughing. So I came back from the chiropractor in the truck. I still remember this, you know, and what had happened, I'll tell you how it worked. In the morning, they said there was a tornado watch. That's what they said. For our area, there's a tornado. But I think tornadoes never come there. They haven't put come down on the ground 70 years in that area. It's too, too many hills. Tornadoes go in flat areas where they can dance around like this, you see. And then they come down and the circle part is what does all the damage. So, you know, he, he said, Bonte looked at me and said, you know, as long as I'm in this center, nothing's going to happen here to, like that. And we all said, okay. And we got in the truck and we went to town for me to go to the chiropractor. I got to the chiropractor and I got on the table for him to crack my back. <laughs> and the phone rang and he gave me the phone. And back at the center, they said, you had to come back here right now. We've been hit. I said, what do you mean you've been hit? She said, we've been hit with a small tornado. And I said, oh my gosh, okay, I'll be right back. I got in the truck, got Bunty, and we drove back. He said, what happened? I said, well, actually, I'll talk to you about it when we get there. <laughs> and we, we got to the gate. The gate was closed. And looking over the gate, there had been 12 trees, big trees. I mean, like, you know, almost put your arm around them like this, you know, trees that were maybe 80 feet high, they were gone. And I looked a little further and it seemed like a large portion of the house was gone. <laughs> and I stood there at the gate and Bonte looked over at me. I was next to him and looking in, we're both facing in. And he says, are you okay? And I just went, well, I don't think we're going to have to pay anybody any money now to take the house away. <laughs> That's what my first remark, because the house was gone, except for one room and a bathroom. It was gone. The kitchen and the other part of it was just gone. And the, you know, certain things were different. The, uh, the office was upside down. And my cootie had been turned upside down and put down on the ground, you see. Very interesting. <laughs> but the reaction was to have a sense of humor. He had taught me enough. And I also said to him, you know why this happened? And he said, why? I said, you weren't on the property. <laughs> so, so the idea that if he's on the property, nothing will happen. Well, you came and drove me to the chiropractor. That's what happened. So it's kind of interesting. What are we going to do with all this? And somebody said to me, it's ridiculous to rehearse what your last words are. You don't know what will happen. I said, I know, I know. However, if I can't say anything, okay, it was good. That's it. Why not? <laughs> you see? We'll see if I can actually pull it off someday. I don't know. <laughs> so listen. Do you have anything else for me, Sarma? No? Yeah. So it is really good. Okay. Let's say our prayer. Okay. Here we go. 
May, May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving may shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long, May they long protect the Buddha's it. dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Have a really 